morning, everyone. How are you all doing this morning? Good, good, good. Folks in the back, get your coffee. Come on down. And uh, we're going to get started. So you, you, you all have on your chair, you may be sitting on it, a passport. This is not connected to the TSA. This will not get you. You'll still have to take your shoes off. Um, this is a little passport that we did um, to announce our latest edition of our uh, World Culinary Arts uh, Savoring the Best of World Flavors project that we've been running for many, many years, well over 10 years, uh, with uh, Unilever Food Solutions. And hopefully many of you have seen, all of you have seen, hopefully, all the great videos that we have been able to shoot um, all over the world as a result of this. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, part of the whole impetus behind creating the Worlds of Flavor conference series was to capture the best of uh, these gold standards in world cuisines, going back to the mother cultures and really seeing what's going on there uh, and inspiring us because we're all busy. Uh, we can't take off you know, three, four years and travel around the world and find all the great street food vendors. Uh, well, we could call Sito in Asia and help with that. But uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it's a big job to scout all this stuff out. And we've done that uh, for you with our partners around the world. Um, so we're very grateful to uh, Unilever uh, Food Solutions for their partnership uh, on this. And, um, you know, a lot of the, the past videos are still available. Um, this will give you a guide to the current um, uh, program that's coming up, including how to access the, the, the site, how to access the recipes. Um, this is the 12th edition coming up. And uh, we're going to just now, I think, preview, uh, this is just being launched, uh, the new edition from Taiwan. So let's roll a little video and take you to the streets and restaurants and markets of Taiwan. See, you're hungry again already, right? <laughs> Good. All right, so be sure and access that. That's a, a fabulous uh, new edition. Uh, the series has won a couple of James Beard Awards, and uh, we're really proud of our digital media team that puts this all together. Um, so another great year for, for that team and that effort. And with that, I'm going to turn the podium back to Anne McBride, who's going to introduce our first session this morning. Thank you. Good morning. The music of this video is really killer. We were dancing backstage. so. You can even watch it without the, uh, without the, just listen to it and get going in the morning. That's awesome. Unilever CIA together for a, uh, an active morning. Who would have thought about that? Um, I want to make just a quick announcement. Uh, we are asking that you please complete the evaluation in the app, the evaluation of the conference. As uh, those of you who know, who've been here before know, we take them very seriously. We use that to plan future programming, um, to fix, uh, and improve every single year over the other, the, the next. So uh, please submit in the app. If you'd prefer to, to submit your comments on paper, we will have paper evaluations in the back as soon as breakfast is cleared out a little bit later. And by completing your evaluation, you get entered to win a free registration to come back for next year's Worlds of Flavor. And as you saw yesterday, next year is our 20th celebration anniversary. So um, there will be lots of really wonderful things in store and you don't want to miss that. You also should register, and even if you win a registration, please get 10 of your closest colleagues and friends to register, okay? Little deal. Um, we are now going to talk about innovation in the Asian kitchen, and as we saw in uh, Sito's keynote on um, Wednesday, um, a lot of what the casual world, um, uh, what casual dining all over the world is doing comes from um, Asia and, and those influences. So. Um, to take us to 
through this session, I'm happy to welcome um, our moderator, Jodi Eddy, who is the former executive ed editor of Art Culinaire. She's a journalist and cookbook author extraordinaire. Uh, she's the author of um, Cuba Recipes and Stories from a Cuban Kitchen, the IACP's Choice Award recipient, North and New Nordic Kitchen of Ice Cuisine of Iceland, and Come In, We're Closed, an invitation to staff meals at the World's Best Restaurant, which was nominated for James Beard Award. She's working on a new book uh, about Iceland, among other things. She writes for a variety of publications about cuisines from all over the world, and so it is our great pleasure to welcome with us the wonderful Jody Eddy. Thank you, Anne. Good morning. You made it. <laughs> Um, so today I'm really thrilled about this incredibly dynamic program we have ahead of us. Um, we'll explore the innovation chefs are employing at their Asian-inspired restaurants in Singapore, Chicago, New York, and Brunswick, Maine. Many of the chefs presenting today work their way around the world before opening their restaurants. Some claim Asian ancestry, while others are simply inspired by the extraordinary flavors, techniques, and dishes to be dis discovered in Asia. The evolution of Asian cuisine has always been driven by casual influences, honed in the dynamic street food markets found throughout Asia. The chefs sharing their dishes and expertise with us today celebrate casual flavors in their restaurants each and every day, driven by the complex and mesmerizing pulse of Asian culinary traditions that fuel their menus. We'll explore the ways in which uh, casual Asian flavors are presenting themselves in 2017 and how we take casual street food and elevate it to a fine casual restaurant experience. I'm pleased to welcome our first chefs to the stage, Sito and Chef Chen. Woo! <laughs> yes! <laughs> It's a great way to start the day. Um, as, as you know um, from his keynote, Situ is the founder of Makan Sutra, incredible um, Asian street food guides, and he's the host of the Makan Sutra television series, which explores the hawker centers of Singapore and the Philippines. Uh, the Asian edition of the Wall Street Journal says that the best way to eat in Singapore is to buy Makan Sutra, and I tend to agree. Um, Sito is also one of the organizers of the World Street Food Congress that's taking place at the end of May this year. And I highly recommend if you have the opportunity to attend and participate. He's also the founder of the Street Food Pro uh, 360 course, which is conducted and curated by Makan Sutra employees. It aims to skill a new generation of current and potential food industry professionals with more than just kitchen and cooking techniques. It seeks to give them a broad stroke perspective of the complex street food business, from cooking, food court and stall management, different street food businesses, design approaches, regional expansion ideas, and success models, to even conducting oneself on social media. One of its speakers and presenters is Chef Chen of HK Street Chunky, and I'm pleased to welcome both incredible chefs to the stage today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So this is uh, Chef Chen, uh, and he speaks horrible English. <laughs> so which means when you go to order food at his stall, it lends color to your experience. What? Man, what? Huh? Oh, huh? And half of the time you get your orders wrong. But for when you get it right, you come up with some of the finest street cuisine uh, dishes uh, that has come out of our region in recent decades. For example, this dish is going to do right now. It's a salted egg yolk crab. Uh, chefs like him don't have official training. He goes to, uh, as a kid, he was forced to go out to work and fend for his family and his brothers. And uh, he started learning from all these big Chinese chefs, very selfish people, you know. So what he did was work and sweep the floor and do cutting and all that with his left eye and learn from the, with the right eye. And uh, he was telling me a story uh, uh, once upon a time when he was in a, and he was bullied by all these chefs, of course. They make them do horrible stuff. And all those things you read about, those horror stories in Chinese kitchens are true. So, so at the age of, I think, 13, they, they gave him, and he knows nuts about the kitchen, they gave him a charcoal. They says, oh, we're going to barbecue things tomorrow. Are you going to wash the charcoal? Mm. No. See, he laughed. 
And this poor guy took a rag and he cleaned. <laughs> he said, okay, it's still black. <laughs> which made the chef respect him. This guy will take orders. So, so they taught him a lot of stuff. Okay, so the uh, salted egg yolk crab. Now we're using a Dungeness crab here. Back home in Singapore, we use the meaty Sri Lanka crabs. If, you've, if you think this is good, wait till you try the Sri Lankan uh, babies. Those are fantastic. So we start off with the crab and uh, so I purposely uh, left this whole uh, steamed crab here to show a little bit of knife work. Uh, how we put this crap apart. Okay. Okay, now. okay now. Typically, we do this into one, two, six sections. And back home in Singapore, we do not throw away the shell. All that gunk around that shell, that's where God hit the flavors. Is it on? Did you see this? Yeah, I'm sure you can see. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Cha! <laughs> Because he's doing it slowly, back in his uh, stall in Singapore. He's got, this man by now has about 11 stalls all over Singapore. To them, cooking has no rules. Uh, growing up in a place like Malaysia and Singapore, you adapt flavors from the Indians, the Chinese, the Indonesians, the West, anything. There are no rules. So as long as he combines anything that works growing up as a child, which is part of his childhood, like I did mention uh, before, if you want to proceed and go ahead with the involvement of your, your menus, you've got to know where you came from. So a lot of your so-called crazy dishes actually make sense. Something like this only appeared in uh, Singapore menus about 10, less than 20 years ago. Today it's iconic. Every seafood restaurant has one form or another of salted egg yolk sauce something. You could do it with uh, calamari rings, you could do it with shrimps, you could do it with fish, chicken, pork, uh, pork ribs, crabs. No rules, no rules. This okay. guy will put anything into anything, so as long as he knows about it, so as long as it works. Give him a chance to introduce truffle oil into fried crab rice, he'll do it in a heartbeat. Okay, okay, okay. okay. so, um, can you see this? Yeah, okay. Of course, you gotta give this a rinse. After a rinse, you get this. Okay, here we go. Now, um, salted egg yolk is a very traditional ingredient or dish eaten by poorer folks. That's the only way of having some salts with their starch, usually rice, porridge, or just plain steamed rice. Uh, it's like a poor man's fare. Uh, but some creative street chef, this dish came from the street, took the yolk only, the white. It's very salty, they remove it for something else, just the yolk. It has that aroma, that sea salt smokiness, um, that he mashes, you steam that yolk and you mash it and you add butter and you add evaporated milk, you can see it in your recipes, and then he enhances it um, with a layer of uh, flavor from curry leaves and he adds a little bit of sting from the chili. So okay, let's get to it. Okay. So firstly, he's gonna just drop it into a wok. So the crab has been steamed, slightly dried, so he's gonna roast it on a wok a little bit just to give it a little bit of color. Now, there are many ways to do this dish. You can um, steam them, like he does now. You can deep fry them. You can dip it in batter and deep fry the little parts and toss it in the sauce later. Or you can barbecue your crabs and then toss it in the sauce. Yeah. It's so Instagrammable, isn't it? <laughs> So just to give it a roasty flavor, just to bring the flavors out. Okay. Oh, yeah. Your favorite? Yeah. Okay, put a little water. No, ah. Uh. Now when you're doing something like this, you know, we just 
it, it looks good, but the art of doing something like this, you got to know when to stop. You know, it's fun, dragging, dragging, it can burn very easily. But one of the skills involved in a, in a, well, with a Chinese chef in doing something like this, they know when to stop. And the nose tells them, the nose and the eyes tells them when to stop. You can just go on and on, you can burn it. Okay, yes, go, go, get yeah. on. Okay, yeah. don't worry, don't worry. Butter? Butter? Yes, yeah. There's no such thing as too little butter. If you are counting calories, you may leave this room now. Yeah, milk. This is evaporated milk. Sometimes you can add half and half evaporated and coconut milk for that layer of extra sin. Sorry? He just added a second ingredient. What was that? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that was the salted egg yolk. Uh, he puts it, he mashes it. it. When you steam it, it's quite soft. Press it into a wok, it just disintegrates into curry. the butter. This is curry leaves. Chili, uh, bird's eye chili. Just for a little sting. And then the... Mind you, look at all that sauce. It's for one crab. That's it. So he reduces it to a certain thickness before he drops the crabs in and gives it a toss. Can you, can you all kind of imagine in your head what this tastes like? Butter, a salted egg yolk which isn't salty, uh, and all that milky goodness with the aroma of curry leaves and chili. So if you don't know, come to his station at lunch, it's got Limited portion. <laughs> he's at, at lunch, he's going to do the tempura version. Each and every piece will be dunked in a, a batter deep fried and then tossed in that same sinful sauce. Yeah, yeah, okay. So today he has about 11 stalls and he sells all kinds of stuff from noodles to seafood to roasted meats. How are we for time? Are we okay? Yeah, you're great. You're oh, 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 I've got time to sing a song. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, I'm going to test the sauce. Street <laughs> style. Oh. Guess what it needs? <laughs> no. <laughs> How'd you guess? How'd you guess? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. There it is. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You want to take a question? We've got some yeah, time. Absolutely. Or anybody you has uh, any question for Chef Chan or myself? Any questions this morning? Yes, yes. sir. Is the recipe Thank for you. salted egg yolks included? Yeah. Are you going to buy them separately Selling. from... Uh, no, no, of course it's in there. Yeah. It's in there. All the recipes use are, are the, on the app. The, the best crepes app. to use is your Alaskan crepes. Okay. Sweet and this uh, sm smoky saltiness made in heaven. Yeah. One more question, anybody? Any more? Morning, we're just getting started. We're getting started. <laughs> only. Yes. Where does the smokiness come from? Is that the salted egg? The fire, and when you roast the salted egg yolk in that fire and the butter. When chefs cook like this, you know, I don't know how to put it uh, across, but over the years watching people cook, um, I realize fire is an ingredient in Chinese kitchens. The way they introduce, the way they burn, it's not just about overburning things. There's a technique, the strength of the fire, the type of fire, jet fire, spread fire, multi-ring fire. So I'm, I'm, I'm also studying, and these are things that chefs learn on their own over the years from their masters, and the masters don't tell them why. They learn by rote learning, and, and over the years, I can tell you it's an art. Using fire as an ingredient it's, it's, it's really an art in the Chinese kitchens. Okay? Thank you, people. Thank Good night. Thank you so Good much. night. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, 
So I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce young, um, young Yoon Park, J.P. Park. He has worked in some of the world's best restaurants, including the Michelin star Cutler & Company in Melbourne, Australia, and the Ledbury in London. He was pre previously the chef de cuisine at Young Sik Dong in Seoul, South Korea, before relocating to New York City in 2012 to serve as the chef de cuisine at Tribeca's Michelin two-star Young Sik restaurant. In 2016, JP and his wife, Alaya, opened the fr uh, their first restaurant, Attaboy, in New York City's nomad neighborhood, focusing on modern Korean fare with a unique Ban Koon style tasting menu. Pleased to welcome you to the stage, Chef Park. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, please watch the video first, please. Yeah. What's that? Video. video. Um. 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 He called like New Korean, Iran was open Randabo, that's all. New Korean, she gave way up, Tadel, Chuganesodo, some Maldon and Sorina, some New Korean in the Krongi Odinia, Temushi. Was a man's arm to Burovacon, Igangu, Michiganina, Joseph Suro to take a man in Hekalyoko, Kinyang, Otiaman, Hango Jagan, Tishiedaga. 그냥 서양의 테크닉을 이제 접목시킨 정도니까 그래도 어쨌든 그게 시발점이 돼서 많은 사람들이 새로운 방향으로 보기 시작을 했던 것 같아요. 제가 처음에 요리를 시작했을 때만 해도 어, 한식은 그렇게 주목을 받았던 음식은 아니었어요. 저의 목표는 그동안의 저의 많은 경험들을 통해서 한국에 돌아가서 되게 멋있는 레스토랑 하나 열어보자. 근데 그러다가 어느 날 차라리 뉴욕에도 오픈하는 건 어떨까? 뉴욕에서 오히려 내가 지금까지 배워왔던 것들, 내가 하고자 하는 것들을 펼칠 수 있으면은 오히려 더 재밌지 않을까? 아토가 순 우리말로 선물이라는 뜻이래요. 여기에 줄수 있는 선물이 무엇일까 고민을 많이 했었는데 그것 중에 하나가 저는 그 반찬의 문화. 전 개인적으로 반찬이 사이드 디시라고 생각하지 않아요. 이제 레스토랑으로 봤을 때 너무 반찬이 너무 공짜로 주어지는 그냥 사이드 디시의 개념이다 보니까. 저는 이제 그런 디시들에게 어떻게 하면 가치를 줄수 있을까 그걸 고민을 하다가 아 그러면 직접 손님들이 선택을 하게 하자 그러니까 사람들이 무엇인가를 자기가 직접 선택을 하면은 거기에 그 가치를 두고 싶어 하는 게 있으니까 음식을 디벨로핑을 할때 만들고 싶었던 그런 여러 가지 모토들이 있어요 그 중에 가장 중요한 게저 개인적으로는 밸런스라고 생각하거든요 음식에서도 뿐만 아니고 이제 삶에 있어서도 사람들이 밸런스를 찾는 게 되게 중요한데 요즘 너무 막 바쁘고 현대 사회다 보니까 빨리빨리 지나가고 사람들이 너무 빠르다 보니까 느린 것들에 익숙하지 못한 것 같아요. 퍼멘티드 된 뭐, 발효의 맛이 강한 뭐, 간장, 된장, 뭐, 청국장 이런 걸 사용하더라도 또 그와 반대되는 되게 프레쉬한 재료들을 섞어요. 항상 이두 가지를 섞어서 우리의 디시를 만든 생각을 하고 또 복잡한 그런 컴플렉스한 맛 뒤에는 되게 심플한 룩이 있고 이런 식으로 모든 거를 다 밸런스 있게 조화롭게 만들려고 노력을 해요. 그런 대표적인 좋은 예가 저는 이제 선초크 디시라고 생각을 해요. 감자조림이라는 그 한국 음식에서 모티브를 땄는데 저희는 그 계절감과 그런 걸 드러낼 수 있는 선초크를 쓴 거죠. 그래서 선초크를 이용해서 오랜 시간 동안 브레이징을 하고 그 선초크에다가 되게 깊은 맛을 더했고요. 
근데 그와 반대로 가볍지만 그 에시드와 좋은 밸런스를 가지고 있는 오렌지를 더함으로써 프레시한 거를 같이 잡으려고 노력을 했고 그런 식으로 서로 다른 재료들이 한 디쉬에 모여 있을 때 손님들이 딱 먹었을 때아 이거 참 밸런스가 좋게 잘 만들어진 디쉬구나 아 두보이가 앞으로 해나간 음식을 되게 잘 보여줄 수 있는 대표적인 음식이라 생각을 합니다. 우리가 음식을 준비하는 과정에 있어서도 많은 부분들이 되게 천천히 준비하고 천천히 오랫동안 시간을 가지고 손님들을 위해서 그 준비하는 그 과정들이 있으니까 그 과정들이 언젠간 손님들에게 전달이 되지 않을까 그래서 그 음식을 먹으면 은아이 사람의 정성? 이 사람이 이 음식을 만들기 위해서 얼마나 오랜 시간을 날 위해 소비를 했구나 라는 걸 느끼면서 조금 더 자기의 삶에 있어서 뭔가 안정감을 느낄 수 있었으면 좋겠다 라고 생각을 해요 My name is Jung Hyun Park. Uh, it's called uh, JP. It's uh, coming from the New York. I run the restaurant called Auto Boy, as you can watch the video. So we're serving the, some little like different type of the Korean food in the, the New York dining scene. It's for me, it's like I got like many experience a lot, a lot of the like kitchen from the like from the London to the Melbourne in Korea, and then I, I personally love the travel a lot. So I travel like more than 30 country. So like when I go to some other country, I tasting like a lot of things from the market and the like really good restaurant as well. So my restaurant themselves is like kind of mashable together about my experience. You know, I'm born, in, born and raised in Korea, so I also have like really strong like taste bud about the Korean food. But at the same time, I'm using like different technique from the when I learn from the like world famous chef, including the Brad Graham and Andrew McNeil. So I'm quickly going to show you a two dish of tonight, uh, today. And the first one is a, a sunchok dish. It's like the, one of the, our signature menu. And the first thing, we're going to make the dashi with the soy sauce. It's a dice, dashi is like kind of basic like kind of stock or sauce for the all, a lot of like Asian countries using for it. So we're making the dashi with the, this is dashima. It's like also known as a kombu. And we just like to put in the cold water and then make them like soak in the water and then bring them boil about like 30 minutes until having really strong umami comes out and then take it out and then after then add some like this is napa cabbage and the moo is like korean radish and also the scallion and also the ginger and the garlic into it and this one is like the, we're making the braising like soy sauce dashi, so it's contain a lot of a little bit of sugar. And this is a soy sauce. In Korea, we call the ganjang. It's a ganjang and like Japanese soy sauce or Chinese soy sauce. It's like all everything is like made by soybean, and they're almost like same process, but that has like a little bit different like the flavor. So this is the ganjang. It's made made with like only soybean, like without any wheat. So, and then mixing together, and then bring up to the boil, and then simmering about 30 minutes. It comes out like really like good strong umami, and good flavor from the like vegetable, and then like sweetness coming from the sugar. So this is like basic soy sauce dashi. And then we're going to braising the, this one, this is sunchok. Sunchok braising into the like this dashi, about like 20 minutes, until like really get soft. So after the soft, it like comes out like kind of this form. So this is like you can see the inside has been like dyed with a, like soy sauce color. So this is like very like common like Korean technique. We're making like any type of the jorim. It's like the kind of braising or some kind of dish. We can using the beef. We can using the potato. We can use like all like different type of vegetable or even the like seafood as well. So I braised already. So this is like ready to go. And then in the meanwhile, I just like heat it up the pan and add a little bit of the like canola oil into it. 
As you can see, like the oil is like moving like really fast, so that means like it's ready to go. So I like, turn it down a little bit. And this, I'm I'm going to add some little bit of the oyster mushroom in it, and season with the salt. So oyster mushroom is like very commonly used in the Korean cuisine. And I love the like the texture and the flavor of the oyster mushroom a lot. So drink and then I I pre I the each chef has like their like preference how to cook the mushroom. But for me it's like I just like like the cooking like really gently. So put into like a little bit low heat and like gently cook and then just coming the just from the oyster uh, oyster mushroom is coming out and then it's kind of emulsified with the oil that I put in. So like gently cook it. And during that time I'm going to slice in the this sancho. So in our restaurant we're using the this sancho and then put into the like the grill and then make it grilled, giving some extra kind of flavor into the dish. But here it's just like the, we just thinly slicing it. So we're talking about the like balance about the, our restaurant. As you can see, the, this sunchok has been braising like long time into the soy dashi, giving some extra deep flavor and extra earthy flavor. And also the, the oyster mushroom has been like, like cooking really like slowly on the stove. But the, meanwhile, it's going to be serving with the, like this, like the fresh orange and serving with this like crispy sunchok. And crispy sunchok has been like really deep fried like really quickly. Like compared to this one, this one is kind of like slowly cooked. This one is like really fastly cooked. And oyster mushroom really earthy and slowly cooked. And this one is really fresh and really good acid. So when I designed all the menu, like I got a, like really a lot of inspiration from the, my like like old experience. Also, I'm always thinking about the balance, like. Something, if it is something is like too earthy, then might be needed something like sharpened. Or if it is too sharpened, then might be something round. So this is uh, how I developing the menu all the time. So I have to gently cook the with some mushroom. So I'm going to plate it on the plate. So I developed this menu like last year fall. Like I just got a like image about you know the during the fall time, you know a lot of the leaf from the like, tree is like going down in the central park. So I just got a, some image from that. So you can see that the color of the like central park, you know. Mm -hmm. So you can put some braising the sun choke. It's like a little bit like soft because it's been braising like long time and then serving with a fresh, like the orange. This orange gives some extra kind of like little sweetness and kind of freshness into the dish. And then this one is a truffle sauce. It's basically like same method of making the, the mayonnaise. Because uh, this is too earthy sometimes, so I just want to make some kind of balance to can kind of line, round up. So I put some little bit of the oyster cream into the dish. And then this is like soy dashi, it's the same dashi with it. Because after cooking the, after braising the, the sunchok, the flavor is like really amazing. So I just put in a little bit into the dish. And then this is horseradish oil, so give it some extra kind of sharpness into the dish. And then finishing with this like crispy sunchok on top. So as you can see, like there is like not too many things about the Korean food, but there's a background about the knowledge about the technique. Is there's a lot of the Korean? You can see if you come to my our restaurant, our pantry is like all made with Korean ingredient or Korean sauce or fermented sauce. So, but the visual wise, like kind of like modern restaurant. This I'm doing. What am I doing in the Atobo restaurant now? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and then I'm going to quickly show you the another dish because I will prepare like two dish. 
So this one also going to be like an example of what am I doing in the auto voice. So I'm prepared like the fresh fruit and then mixing with the dongchimi is uh, like the white kimchi made, in, made by the radish. And then mixing with this is dongchimi. It's like, it's like really funky, it's kind of like really like the flavor. So it's, as I told you about the, the balance, it's like mixing with the fresh ingredient with the, like old ingredient together. So this one also seasoned with the soy sauce. And this is like fermented the uh, yuja and the jalapeno is mixing with the cream. So this one is like, yeah, need to be mixing together and then serving with the, the fresh fruit. So it's going on the mold. And also, I'm doing the, some marketplace today. So if you guys have any question about the Art Boy or some of my cuisine, just like come to the downstairs and then please ask me whatever you guys want. <laughs> yeah. So this is the other dish. It's a fluke. Thank you so much. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. So our next chef um, that I'm really excited to welcome to the stage today is Abe Conlin. He's the chef and owner of Fat Rice, um, and he's also the author of the Fat Rice Cookbook. Abe grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts, where he was inspired by the culinary influences of his Portuguese heritage and the Southeast Asian community in his city. He started as a professional chef at the tender age of 15 with mentors that included John Mathiasen and Frank Giovanni. He's a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, and following graduation, he cooked in the Dominican Republic and at Augustine's in Virginia before moving to Chicago, where he met Adrian Lowe, his future wife, and a partner in their restaurant, Fat Rice. The restaurant is a full circle return to his Portuguese roots, filtered through Macanese cooking. Last fall, his illustrated cookbook, Fat Rice, was published, and it's definitely a must. I don't know if um, you've seen it, but it's incredible cookbook, um, really beautiful, and it's a must for anyone interested in exploring Macanese culinary traditions. I'm pleased to welcome Abe to the stage today. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been an amazing weekend. Um, this dish, uh, what we're doing uh, at Fat Rice, like Jody said, uh, we explore uh, the food of Macau. We started with the food of Macau, a mixture of Portuguese, Chinese, Malay, Indian, but also we explore heritage recipes that built those, that cuisine. So we look at Eurasian communities in Malaysia, in Goa, but even all the way to uh, Portugal and Brazil. This dish is not a heritage recipe. This is, this is a dish that predates Fat Rice, the restaurant. Um, before we opened the restaurant, uh, I envisioned myself cooking these large, beautiful surf clams from Ipswich um, in some nondescript counter and, <laughs> and simply just serving them on the half shelf. So we dedicated eight pages in the book, two months of extensive back and forth uh, work with the illustrations on how to break these uh, animals down and how to cook them with a, with a, with a walk comic. Um, I'm going to do this in 15 minutes or so, okay? So, um, this is a combination. I got frustrated when I would go to a Chinese restaurant and, they and I would get a live uh, piece of shellfish, whether it was a, a scallop or a surf clam in this particular case, and it was steamed with mung bean noodle, black bean, scallion, cilantro, and garlic. But inevitably, the Varying, varying parts of the uh, shellfish was always over or undercooked, usually over, and it was a shame to see uh, this animal uh, die in that way. Um, so, because I grew up around these in, in the uh, beaches around Massachusetts, these ones come from Ipswich, it's a beautiful thing, but um, we're going to treat it right. So we separate out the tongue and the collar, the abductor muscle, we cook them all separate. So. Starting from the side with the long knife here. You gotta watch out because they are 
vicious beast. He just closed his, his mouth up, <laughs> flexing down, cut through the abductor muscle. On both sides. Opens up like that. So you can see the collar, the siphon, the belly. This is, this is the adductor muscle here. It's almost like a scallop. And then you have uh, the, what we call the tongue. Again, we do the other side. Now there's lots of sand, lots, lots of kind of goop in there, even though if, even if you purge them in, in salt water. So what we do is we have some salted ice water, cut the abductor muscle off, along with the collar, the siphon, move that to the side. We have the lungs here, those get removed. The belly, remove that as well. And then you have the foot, one abductor muscle, two abductor muscle, the collar, which we cut, slice down, slice through the siphon. There's a little um, kind of mouth on the siphon, which we slice off. How are we doing for time? Four minutes, great. <laughs> And then we put those into water to get the uh, sand off of there, at least the adductor and the collar. If you want, we can do our shells, but through the magic of television, I've already boiled my shells. <laughs> okay, so now what we do we have mung bean noodles, it's a mung bean starch uh, thread, mung bean, or thread noodle made from mung bean starch. They cook very, very fast. So while we're doing that, this is soaking. And I always imagine doing this all in one shot and in service, but inevitably we would sell about 30 of them a night and uh, we weren't actually able to kill the clam and go all the way through. We'd have to uh, prep them, break them down before service. And uh, that is one of the reasons why, at Fat Rice, we do not serve this dish anymore. Because <laughs> it is also very hard to get the Ipswich clam delivered to Chicago live, unbroken, fresh. So once the uh, mung bean noodles are soft, we transfer them to the bowl. We plunge in our, excuse me, we plunge in our tongue, five seconds, one, two, three, four, five, shock, I'm going to turn this down a little bit, so we're going to let that, let that uh, cool for a minute. Now we have our abductor muscle and collar here. We are, so in the clam, there you go. There's the chili clam right there. Um, in the clam shacks of uh, New England, where I grew up, we always had wonderful fried clam bellies. It was, it was something I loved and, and that was something that I wanted in, to incorporate in the dish. So we have a mixture of cornmeal, cornstarch, but we, we put a good amount of chili in there. You can use whatever kind of chili you want. We have Sichuan peppercorn, which gives a nice kind of numbingness to uh, balance out the chili. And then salt, of course. And this is just a simple egg wash. So we would have these adductor muscles and collars separate. They, they become nice and, nice and firm and crunchy. And you want to keep that texture and without, and without compromising the texture of the tongue, which cooks differently. So simple batter here. You could do this with really anything, buttermilk or anything like that you like. 
How are we doing? Seven minutes? We got yeah, plenty of time. Doing well. <laughs> so, um, this is a really interesting dish that I, I just I just love. It's a combination of my my culture and my upbringing and uh, Chinese cuisine, which I love, and, and absolutely delicious fresh seafood. So I'm going to hold on to this over here. We're going to get to frying that in a moment. That's going to happen at the very last minute. For the noodles, what we're going to do here, we have a little bit of butter, a good amount of garlic. Can we see that? There's camera on that, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. A good amount of garlic. Bird's eye chili, you could use any kind of chili you like. Fermented black bean, um, you can use the Chinese style or the Filipino style that's in uh, water, which I like to use as well. Okay. A little bit of lemon juice, just to give acidity and balance to the whole thing. And we combine that with our mung bean noodles. Along with shredded green scallion and preserved lemon achar. Uh, this is, you know, a wonderful condiment that many chefs use these days and um, in Macau, they call it uh, a char de uh, limon de timor, which from from Timor, Indonesia, and uh, really just delicious salted uh, lemon pickle. So we have our noodles mixed there. I'm going to move this back here. Don't get nervous. It's all good. <laughs> Don't be nervous. So. Uh, we have our tongue here. So what we're going to do is just slice it super thin. I mean, you could totally eat it raw just like this. Get it a little better so you can see it. And you can see it curls just like a gooey duck. But again, the idea of this preparation was really to be, n to be nice to the clam because you don't know, see he gets very angry if you're, if you're not nice to him and you overcook him. <laughs> um, so what we do, as, as the noodles are already warm, and this is already warm, we can just really add our, our tongue to that, add a s small pinch of salt, it already has a lot of salinity in it. And then we get ready to steam. So we load up our clams here, four minutes. A little bit of noodle. This is a good, this seems like a lot of work to go for an appetizer just for two, but <laughs> it's definitely a fun one for sure. Mm -hmm. But sadly, not offered in the restaurant any longer. Sadly, <laughs> what? Not offered in the restaurant not any longer. Not, you know, I might, we have had a lot of protests. You know, it's been, it's been actually really great and interesting. Since the book has come out, mm -hmm. we have taken a lot of the recipes off of the menu that are in the book. Um, just so we can explore other ideas, other, other forms of our cuisine. Um, so it's, it's been a blessing and a curse. So we are, so we have, we were getting ready to steam and while we're getting ready to steam, we're going to do our fry. So we don't necessarily need a thermometer. We can utilize a chopstick. The inherent moisture in the chopstick will release enough moisture to give you the sign of having about the size of a quarter. Uh, bubbles are about the size of a quarter and that's about 375. So, I'm going to make sure our clam pieces are nice, nicely breaded. I'm just going to take them out so that we don't have too much extra flour. And as you can see, this isn't really steaming. I haven't, I haven't covered it up because, again, I don't want that clam to get angry on me and curl all up. So this kind of happens simultaneously. The other reason why we don't do this is because it was a two-station pickup. One person had to fry the clam, one person had to steam the clam. And it's so time sensitive, it didn't make the cooks very happy. They were, they were, they were always scared of the chili clam. 
As apparently they should be. As they, they should be. I mean, look at that thing. <laughs> no, my, my our artist Sarah Beacon, um, who's amazing, who actually Chef Matthias also works with in Logan Square, um, she really helped us convey these ideas of what we had on the menu through kind of bold imagery that we utilize at, um, as posters on the front door in lieu of signage. So, um, again, the chili clam was the first uh, picture that she drew, and obviously the one we wanted to have on the cover of the book. So, so now, again, it's a very, very quick fry, and a very, very quick steam. And you can see it's just glistening and, and beautiful. Put a small amount of salt on the, on the fried parts. And then we kind of have two nice textures that are individually cooked. A little cilantro. At fat rice, cilantro is a vegetable. <laughs> We love it. It really, it really gives amazing contrast to lots of the dishes that we do that are, that are rich or fatty. And um, it's an amazing thing that we, we love. And uh, I think that's it. Wow, fantastic. And then we just serve, usually we serve this on, on the seaweed that the clams come with, but the clams didn't come with any seaweed. How do you like that? Do you think that looks good? <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's it. Any questions? We have one minute. Anybody one minute. have a question? Thank you. Good night. No? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, the next chef um, that we're welcoming to the stage today is Kara St Stadler. She grew up making Shanghainese uh, classics, but her culinary background spans the globe. She began her career at the age of 16, where she worked at Cafe Rouge in Berkeley, followed by Striped Bass in Philadelphia, before heading to Paris to stage at Guy Savoy and to work with Gordon Ramsay's Michelin two-star restaurant in Versailles. Her overarching culinary goal has always been to introduce new flavors to the table, while also paying homage to traditional ingredients and recipes. In 2008, Kara headed to Asia, where she worked in Singapore at the French-Japanese restaurant Saint-Pierre and headed up Gourmet Underground in Beijing. In 2009, she moved to Shanghai and began her long-standing relationship with one of China's most esteemed restaurateurs, David Laris. She launched 12 Chairs for Laris, which has been hailed as one of Asia's best restaurants. Kara finally returned to the U.S. in November 2011, where she works with her mother to bring to Brunswick, Maine, her unique twist of contemporary Asian fusion, combined with the bounty of local Maine flavors at Taoyuan. Really pleased to welcome to the stage today, Chef Stadler. Thank you. <laughs> hi. Okay, so, hi. <laughs> uh, the dish we're doing today is called uh, Yang Yo Ma Dofu. It's a dish that I ate many years ago in China, totally forgot about, and then went back to again and ate again. It's a, like a Beijing homestyle dish, and it stemmed from the fact that we have a restaurant where we try to use everything, and we started making our own tofu. Mm -hmm. And when you make your own tofu, you're left over with a byproduct of what's called okara in Japanese. It's called tofu pulp in English, but nobody knows what that is. <laughs> um, and so we have this, which is, this is the end result product. It's the soybean uh, pulp that's left over after you make soy milk and strain it through cheese glass. So we're gonna start by just making soy milk. We've soaked the beans overnight at a very specific ratio to water. We've taken half of that water and put it on the stove and get it boiling. So this is just to make soy milk to start. And then the rest of the water and the soaked beans are just gonna get thrown into the Vitamix and blend it up until you get essentially a soybean like milky shake. Um, and this is left with like a very, it's very raw, it's just raw soybeans. It's got a very intense, a slightly acrid flavor. It's sort of, when you eat a banana too unripened that you get that sort of tingle on your tongue. Um. Oh, this is really loud. <laughs> It'll take about a minute. see 
gets a little foamy on top and just looks like soybean puree. It goes into the boiling water. Uh, it doesn't have to be boiling, but if you want this not to take you forever in your restaurant, it helps to just get the water started ahead of time. Um, and then this will take and just bring it to a simmer and it will form sort of essentially, if you've ever made a consomme, like a raft on top from the proteins pulling up, and then that is sort of when you're gonna wanna pull it. I'm not sure we're gonna get to that point today, <laughs> because. How long would it typically cook? I mean, it, it, doesn't, it cooks just for a few minutes after okay. it comes up, okay. um, but I'm not sure it's gonna get there fast enough in this mm -hmm. demo. But you can see it's getting froth, I mean, it gets frothy right away. It's a small batch, so this actually might make it. After it comes up to a head and sort of forms that foamy raft, and before it boils over and ruins your stove for the entire day, <laughs> you wanna pull it off and just strain it through a cheesecloth. Um, I actually found that the scallop fishermen sell bags um, that they keep, they sell their scallops in. They're these huge, very, very fine cloth bags. And cheesecloth is great, but if you put, exert too much pressure on it, it can sometimes burst on you, which is why it's great for cheese, because you don't really put pressure on it. But yeah. it, for a soybean, you really wanna like wring it as dry as you can. And what you're left with is this sort of very soft pulp. Um, in Japan, they use it for breakfast. They throw it into dumplings. It's a great binder. Uh, and it's great for vegan food because it's, it's vegan. It's just beans. And it actually is a great sort of starch to bind everything. Um, the other components of this dish are pickled fermented mustard greens, which we make in-house. And that's, this is a mixture of diced pickled mustard greens and confit lamb belly. The lamb belly, again, is also a byproduct in our restaurant. We buy lamb racks or, or lamb loins. They're wrapped in a fat cap. That fat cap is a little excessive for anybody to serve. Customers will get frustrated when they're served a piece of lamb with such a huge cap on it. So we trim that off, salt cure it, and then just sous vide cook it overnight so it's braised and confit. That gets diced and mixed with the pickled mustard green, and then we're gonna put it into a pot on high heat with a little bit of oil. And you said the mustard greens are pickled? Pick, uh, Lacto-fermented pickle. So um, you can use, ideally, if you, if you can get weirder greens around, like you can ask your farmers for flowering greens that have shot up out, like they make a more aromatic flavor, but you can generic, buy a generic pack of pickled mustard greens in your Asian grocer. Um, and this is just essentially a quick, it's not a quick fry, it's a sort of a fried, stirred, this is the end result. It takes about half an hour to get here, that acridness, will mellow out over time, and you need to add in large, large quantities of lamb fat. Um, there was a lot of lamb fat, of which then someone took it and put it on the stove and it went up in flames yesterday. Oh, no. So I don't have the lamb fat to demo for you, but we got some before it all happened and got it into the dish itself. It takes, um, this would take about two cups of lamb fat wow. on its own. So it's about a quart and a half of pulp to two cups of fat. So this is not a healthy dish in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> um, you wanna put a little fry on the mustard greens. If you take mustard greens, like they're very delicious raw. You can see the head forming right now, by the way. It's like right on the edge. It's starting to come up. Um, so high heat. Opa. Take this guy. And you're just gonna put a little bit of color on these guys. I also am a big fan of caramelization. And we sort of try to mimic what a wok would do in two seconds in a lot of pans because we're half Asian and half very Western influence. Um, and the lamb's gonna start to stick to the bottom, that's fine. It's gonna pick up color and that's also fine because once you add the soybean pulp, that water is gonna seep into the base and it's all gonna come off the bottom and you want all those little brown bits folded back in. And then once you've got that, it starts to stick a little bit and you can see the mustard greens are popping out of the fat. You're just gonna add your okaru, okara, and this will be here for 30 minutes to an hour. And as it goes, we'll add fat and water. So it Stop. has a pretty high smoke point. Um, no, the, we're, now I've just turned it down to super low. Okay. So once you've added your, this will burn now. This is where you wanna sort of slow it down. Okay. Actually, if I can get some water. We'll slowly add stock or water into it. I mean, I would use stock probably and lamb stock if I had it, but uh, we basically use what we have in water. If you do this as a vegetarian version without the lamb, it's also delicious and you'd use a canola oil. And then this just goes for about 30 minutes. Um, 
maybe longer, just depending on the size of the batch. And over time, that flavor will disappear, and you'll be left with this sort of very rich, semi-funky, very lamby soybean hummus is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, there it is, there we go. So that head is forming. I'm gonna turn it down. And we'll strain it through. Mm -hmm. so it hopefully won't make a huge mess. So this dish, was one of these dishes that I had in China, and I was like, why aren't we making this in the US? <laughs> the first time I went to China, I came back obsessed with Jen Bing's. Mm. Uh, that was like 10 years ago. And then we started putting them on the menu five years ago when we opened, and now they're in the New York Times, which just makes me really excited. <laughs> so I'm hoping that this will have something similar of an effect. It's like an old, old Beijing dish that nobody's heard of that I'm hoping people will get excited about. And the other thing that's really great about it is it really is, use, is the use of byproduct. I mean, all of these things are leftovers. Mustard greens are greens that are leftover that are going bad in your kitchen. You just salt pickle them. So there's something that you could have gone to waste or could have gone to compost, and instead you found a purpose for it. The okara is a leftover product from making tofu or soy milk in your restaurant. Um, and the lamb belly, the lamb fat is something that most people don't use. You don't. Some people will use a lot of their lamb fat, but there's an, there's, it's an excessive amount if you start breaking down whole animals, what's left over. Um, and so really, you're basically, this is a dish from nothing. It's like a dish all just made of leftover, and it's one of the most incredibly flavorful dishes I've ever had. So this will, the soy milk was in the demo yesterday I did, which we did a soy milk custard for, and the, wow, so hot. I would say that normally this wouldn't be done so fast, and I would try not to burn myself. So we'll take that and just twist it. Um, would you typically let it cool down um, yes, for absolutely. several minutes? Or yes, because uh, I wouldn't be burning myself. <laughs> no, but how, how long would you let it cool? Oh, just till, till I can handle it. Okay. I mean, okay. If, you would probably do it, you want to do it fast enough that you're not, it's a protein, so if you're yeah. going to leave this out, I mean, you're leaving a protein out, so it's going to go mm -hmm. bad over time, yeah. it's going to ferment. Granted, frequently you get a semi-fermented version of this in China, mm. but that is with much more, con well, it's actually probably not with much more control. It might not be <laughs> much more control. Um, but it, uh, the fermented one is really, really good. It's got a much darker hue than the one that I've made, mm. and it's delicious, but I have not done enough experimentation with fermented tofu to feel comfortable enough to be sure that I'm not going to poison one of my guests. <laughs> um, so this I'm just twisting and twisting. You can see all the juice is coming, all the milks is coming out. Fresh soy milk, by the way, is like, is like nothing else like, compared to what you get in the stores. And you can't substitute one for the other. Um, and it's something that, that like, as we've started working with, it's really, and something that's a commodity in China, and something that I hope over time people will do in their homes. And they now sell tofu machines like that you can buy. You just put soy milk, soybeans in the machine, and X hours later you have wow. to soy milk. Oh. Um, and you can't make tofu without fresh soy milk. Store-bought soy milk has mm -hmm. things in it that yeah. it just doesn't work itself out. <laughs> All right, so there's your okara. So this is how you make, this is what you make tofu with. This is when you add your Epsom salts and you set it, and you set it in cheesecloth or in a bag and you'll press that overnight and then you'll have tofu. So that's your soy milk or you can just drink this as is. And then the okara is the byproduct. Okara, saying that incorrectly. And you're just left with this. That's it. I mean, it's very delicious and you can eat it as is. But it doesn't have a lot of flavor. <laughs> So after this is cooked for half an hour, you're left with sort of this darker, huge color. And we've added about two cups of fat. And we finish this dish with the, um, the remaining lamb fat that we have left over, poured over chilies. We heat the fat to 275 Fahrenheit um, and take chilies and just pour it over, let it sit for a hot second. And then once it's fully cooled down, that takes a while. So once that's fully cooled down, we'll put it into a blender. And you wanna save all the bits in this you want all the chili. This is supposed to be a raging, like, burn your mouth dish. Um, and in the restaurant, we also serve it with a naan, as we're in America, and people like to eat dips with, with some sort of bread. And in China, what you would get is literally just a spoonful of this, 
with the chili oil on top, and you just eat it with your chopsticks. Um, but that didn't go so well when we did it at the restaurant, so the, the bread on the side is definitely a big help there. Um, and naan, as we're an Asian restaurant, we sort of dabble in all sorts of Asian cuisines. And when I say a lot of chili oil, I mean, like, okay, so there's two cups of fat in this, and then you're putting another quarter cup of fat on top. Wow. So, like, this dish is not for those who don't like to eat fat. <laughs> but I, when I, we, you know, break down our animals and we save every scrap of fat and we try to reutilize it and not waste anything, and part of what this whole dish is about is that. Mm-hmm. And then that goes to the table, and you just put a handful of scallions on top. That's it. Wow. Some bread on the side. Fantastic. That's it. Um, We have just a few minutes. If anybody has any questions. Okay. Okay. Yes. (laughs) Oh, Epsom salts to make tofu. So, yeah, you can use, when you make tofu, you can add an, you can use Epsom salts to set it. So it's just depending on what kind, what you want to use. Just like cheese sets with different types of curdling and different types of acid, you can, tofu, Epsom salt is frequently used to make. I can't. Like a rennet. So, yeah, sort of, exactly. I mean, it, it's cheese. It's essentially soybean cheese is what you're making when you're making tofu. So you're making, it's, it's done in the same process. It's almost mimics the process, so. No, no, you can do, well, it depends. You can also use acid instead of Epsom salts, so. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So I'm really excited to welcome our last chef to the stage today. Um, Matthias Murgis began working professionally in restaurant kitchens at the tender age of 14. He's a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America. And after graduation, he moved to Chicago, where he worked at Carlos's Latour at the Park Hyatt, Gabriel's, and the 95th. He helped open um, Metropolitan in Salt Lake City before moving back to Chicago to work at Charlie Trotter's, where he served in various capacities for 14 years. He opened his Yakitori-inspired restaurant, You Show, in 2011, followed by A10 and Billy Sunday. He's also a founding member of Pilot Light, a nonprofit organization that helps children make healthier food choices by connecting the lessons they learn in their classrooms to the foods they eat on their lunch trays, at home, and in their communities. And I personally know that um, Chef Mat- uh, <laughs> Matthias will be really fired up today because we had an incredible dinner last night at Single Thread Farms, and I think he's feeling really inspired. So it's going to be a great presentation. <laughs> and once he's here, <laughs> we look fantastic. Hi. <laughs> Great. So welcome to the stage. Hello. The <laughs> How's everyone doing? Awesome. So we had a, we did have an epic, epic meal <laughs> last night. It was incredible, and it made me uh, kind of change my whole demo today to talk about something completely different. And um, I want to start out with like talking about like the word innovation and what it means. And you're know, like, Jody, what is innovation to you? Well, after last night, I think it's changed a bit. <laughs> I think so too. So yeah. you know, people look at innovation, they think about cooking in the kitchen yeah. where, wow, we're using polyscience and we're using different technologies to, to manipulate food. And, and since I've been able to sit in a few of the, the sessions, there's been an ongoing theme where people are abandoning what is typically thought of innovation in kitchen. And they're going back to something that's tradition and set in time. And that's been true. Um, and last tested night, over exactly, the and tested. And so last yeah. night, for example, it was like a, the aha moment of like, this is really happening now, where they have Dunabi ware, and everyone, who knows, who knows what Dunabi ware is from Japan? They're Japanese clay pots exactly. that they use. It's a cooking Japan. vessel. And, um, they're made from a certain part of Japan in a, 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 a prefecture called Iga. And they're made in a certain thickness with seashells and mud and sand from certain areas. And I'll have to tell you this, that we had a piece of fish last night that was cooked as if innovative chefs these days would cook in sous vide yeah. and you know, put an immersion circulator and come out with this almost like a confit uh, texture. And, 
last night doing this earthenware came out with so much more impressive and beautiful uh, example of what that is. And I think that we look at some of the other people here. Um, uh, was it Eric who was, was doing the, the meat on the coals, uh, the pit fires outside? And um, so we decided to do like old fashioned curry in a mortar and pestle. You know, most people either buy curry powders and they mix it together and they heat it up on the stove or they put all these things into a blender. And uh, over time in my travels and things that, you know, we always say that the, the knife that you use, the way that you cut, it impacts and influences the flavors of what your product is. So especially in fish, the way you cut a piece of fish, you can cut it 10 different ways and you have 10 different results of flavor at the end from the same loin or wherever the cut is from. So we're gonna talk a little about that. And you know, I was really uh, inspired and I'm always inspired about coming to California and especially this time of year. So I really don't have a recipe and I don't really think, you know, I'll just throw it out there. People don't really care about recipes right now. I'd rather have you have a different mindset on how you approach food and how you are uh, you engage food um, and your relationship with it and taking the time to slow down and be present as you cook and exploring different cuisines and you know taking the time to really enjoy it so okay here we go but Just first I want to say that uh, coming back to CIA I'm like the old timer here I think I'm the oldest <laughs> graduate of CIA on the schedule so <laughs> Bear with me if I have any senior moments. Um, so I also want to thank uh, the Culinary Institute uh, with giving us such wonderful help and staff, and especially Megan, who I'm going to bring out to help me. Megan, come on out. I want to give a big hand to Megan over the past few days. She's done an incredible job, and she's, uh, she's on her way to some great things. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, curry and different products and how to look at them and analyze them and you know curries are great because it can become a very um, personal expression of things that you like you can eliminate things that you don't like uh, I'm gonna just take this and move this aside for later so I can eat that <laughs> and we'll get that going there so um, you know through my travels there's some really things that stand out uh, and curry is one of them curry to me is uh, it transcends not only from uh, you know India or Southeast Asia, but it you know curry is mole, really, right? So it's there's this commonality. Yesterday we did a demo uh, on kanji, which is a rice rice porridge dish, which goes across. So I love taking things that are commonplace and everyday, where people think it's kind of like a low cuisine, and kind of like elevate it and make it kind of fresh and my own. So we're going we're gonna to start off with the Thai mortar and pestle, which one of the chefs was so generous to loan us. Let me fold that real quick. There we go. What we want to do is, so we have, we have some delicious stuff. So we have galangal. Everyone knows what galangal is. We have uh, turmeric root, ginger, lemongrass, garlic. Uh, we have kefir lime leaf, we have bird's eye chili, uh, some green chili, and some onion product. And does anyone know why I have these lined up the way they are? So what, as i gone through that, what can someone point out? What happened there? Anybody? Chef? <laughs> Jody? <laughs> anyone? Okay, so it's in, the, it's in the line of hardness. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to start with the hardest product, and when you add it to your mortar and pestle, you're going to start breaking that down. So go ahead. So we're going to like pound that out. Exactly. <laughs> just go for it. And what you want to do is as we add these and as they start breaking down, by the time you end with the softest one, the hardest one is the same consistency. So, and what we're doing there is we're starting to build flavor and we're building layers of flavor and we're keeping things super fresh and we're keeping the characteristics of each ingredient as pure as we can. So I can smell that from here. Do you smell that? Yeah. It smells awesome. So let's see what we got going on there. Oh, you got a long way to go. 
this usually takes like an hour, and we usually give it to someone who's like late to work, or if they, they if family meal was bad, then they have to do this job. So we keep going, then we'll just start adding more and more. And as you add more, you can tell that there's like, first it was like the galangal smell, and now the turmeric is starting to come together, but you're smelling like both happening. How's it looking? Oh, you got a long way to go. Okay. <laughs> but for TV, we made the finished product. So we're gonna add our ginger, and just pretend that this is all breaking down. <laughs> And eventually it'll turn into like this beautiful paste. So we're just gonna add it all in there. Oh yeah. That is smelling tasty. So we're gonna add our chilies. Love the heat. And then we're gonna add our onion product. And we're gonna set this aside. And while Megan is doing that. Um, I decided, like, let's use something that's uh, California. So the products that we use, we got this uh, wonderful um, Pacific Amberjack, otherwise known as Kampachi. Um, and then we went outside in the parking lot and we forged for some stuff. So, you know, some things like the, the fennel and uh, some blossoms and some mints. And then uh, it, in Chicago, we... Um, I love the whole idea of local, local food. Who loves local food? Like, who buys local? That's it? So what, is, what does local mean? I mean, how, who, who lives in an, an urban environment? How local is local? So you have like, Mm -hmm. So, like restaurateurs and chefs, especially like in Chicago, we're like, yes, I buy local. I get my pork from northern Michigan, and I get stuff from Ohio, and I get things like that. And I was saying to myself, like, why does it have to be like that? And myself and my wife were really, very uh, philanthropic minded, and we really like to give back to the community a lot. So, I think Jody mentioned um, uh, the founding of Pilot Light Chefs. Uh, an organization where we create curriculum for teachers to use in classrooms that is uh, in line with the core curriculum so they can use it every single day for every child, uh, which is, you know, it's our eighth year with that. And we also, um, I helped start a, um, a, a program in the Cook County Jail, the world's largest correctional facility for anybody who knows that. Uh, and what we did is we went into the, uh, the jail and we created a program with the sheriff and it's a program for nonviolent felons. So if you're a felon, it's seven years, you're in, there's no parole, you can't get out. So we created a, a one-year program where it's a boot camp where if they want to go through this, it's, uh, it's on four acres of gardening. And we created a seed bank and we helped them uh, understand kind of like the economics behind having a job, this is what you need to do, and then we buy all the product back from them and use it in all our restaurants. And then we also started um, having small micro urban farms in the south side of Chicago where we take vacant city lots and we build gardens, um, which we contract out with a farmer that we use and we supply all our restaurants with all that food and we hire super local so if it's an Inglewood, which is, I don't know if anybody knows Inglewood in Chicago, it's like when you hear about all oh, those shootings in Chicago, it's crazy, uh, that's Inglewood. So we go down there and do a lot of work and uh, it's been great. Anyways, so what I'm saying is I love super local, buy super local and help your, uh, help your community. So this is where some of those things come from. So the onions, the ramps, uh, some pickles from last year, the kimchi that we use. We try to utilize everything and, you know, do that. So how are we looking? Looking. It's looking good. It's not quite a paste, but we're going to go on to that. So what we're going to do is we are going to make our curry. Anyways, back to the Amberjack. 
Pacific. I love it. Okay, there's our stuff. So we have a little bit of coconut oil. We have coconut paste, coconut water, and a little bit of fermented shrimp paste, which I love. Gives it some kind of funkiness, which is awesome. So first thing we're going to do is get this thing rocking. Joe, did you have any questions for me, by the way? I know we <laughs> talked about this last night. You said you would have a lot. Or does anybody have any questions at this point that I can answer about anything? It doesn't have to be about this. It could be whatever. I, I actually don't have a question, but I had an experience with Matthias at a conference once where um, an executive chef, he was talking about, um, he was, he, Matthias was on a panel, he was talking about the program that he started in um, the local prisons, and this executive chef stood up and he said, I was a prisoner, and your program changed my life. And truly, it was one of the most inspiring conference moments I've ever had. So it's always stuck with me. <laughs> All right. So this is usually turns into a pace, but it will take much too long. I only have two minutes left. So <laughs> we're going to add that in with the shrimp paste. And the reason we're going to give it a good sear is that these products have a really angular and sharp flavor to them. So we just want to mellow that out. Because most people will take this curry and they'll uh, serve it hot, and you'll, they'll cook chicken or shellfish. And it's really traditional, and, but since it's springtime in Napa Valley, I'm like, we're gonna serve it cold. And I love cold curry, especially like if you order from your Thai restaurant around the corner, and then you have like green duck curry, and you wake up in the morning and you like open that little container and you're like eating it cold. <laughs> so that was kind of like an inspiration for me. On that. <laughs> So what we used to do is like cook it out a little bit. We still want to maintain. So you got that shrimp paste and all these flavors starting to meld together. And then you're just going to add a little coconut water. And we let that cook down. I'll leave that right there. We have a little amberjack filet we got yesterday. I'm going to get my bowl. Boop, boop. And I love raw fish. I'm a big raw fish lover. I think it's like the perfect thing for spring. So what we're going to do is we're going to make like a little salad of raw fish and curry and delicious parking lot foraging. No laughing, please. It's a very serious moment. So if you've not been to single thread, you must go immediately, if not sooner. Epic experience. All right, we got zero time left. Sorry. I know everyone wants to get out of here. You have to bear with me for Couple more seconds, so we'll just start there. Put that there. So this is cooking down, and then we add our cream coconut, and then this is going to start getting thick and delicious. And then we take that, let it cook out. It's beautiful. It's like confetti. This might, well, instead of turning into paste, this might be actually a, a new dish right here. So what would the next, just to walk us through quickly? Are you saying? Like, you're telling me to stop? <laughs> okay, so we have this. You take that, you pass it through Shinwa, you get this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some of these beautiful things from the outside. So we have all this deliciousness here. We have some of these things, some fennel from right outside. You guys gotta go check it out when you're there. Some of these blossoms we got from this hike we did yesterday, the state park, the other day. Some fennel blossoms. And then we'll toss those in with a little bit of vinaigrette. Good. And we have like a little salad to clean it up. 
I'm going to take a little bit of this stuff here. So these are pickled onions from last year from the gardens. And then we have a little bit of kimchi pickle. And these are just nori. So we have this. We take a little bit of curry. I put a little pool in there. Like so. Like a little surprise. Then we take this. This will be right in the middle. And then we're going to take some nori so people can like use their hands. So I love eating with my hands. And we're just going to throw that in there like this. That's all I got for you. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. No time for questions. Thank you. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Jody. Thank you to all of our other presenters. We are now going to breakout sessions. So if you are going to seminars, you can leave right away. But if you are in kitchen workshops, please wait in the back until I make the announcements. If you are in seminar, four, seminar 14, you are in Ecolab on the first floor. To the left, 15, De Bonne, to the, uh, to the right downstairs, Williams, that's seminar 16 at the bottom of the hill. Rudd sem for seminar 17 and 18 is at the top of the hill on the left. And then kitchen workshops, just wait in the back for a little bit. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joseph Meddy. I'm the executive sous chef for Rich Products. And today we're going to reinvent a classic apple pie. We're going to make a French toast apple pie using Rich's rich and easy French toast batter. This is Rich's Italian panini bread, and we're going to make our crust for the apple pie. I'm just going to take off some of the crust very simply. I want to make it as even as possible. Take your panini bread and just give it a little smush down here. And the trick to make it very even is we're going to use a pasta roller, put it on the thickest uh, setting, and just roll it. I'm going to do it at least twice. I want to take your two slices of pressed uh, Italian panini bread and soak them in the French toast batter for at least a minute. I have a single serving here or a dessert for two. It's a four and a half inch spring form pan. Just take some butter grease the pan. So after these soak for about a, a minute or two, you want to take the panini bread out of your uh, mixture here, lay it in and just kind of maneuver it so it goes along the edges here. It's okay if you have some sticking out. Take your other slice of panini bread, form it to the bottom of the pan, press it in. Just have a classic apple pie filling here. Granny Smith apples, a little butter, brown sugar, regular sugar, and some flour. Make sure you get some of the juice in there. Take some classic crumb topping, butter, sugar, some um, cinnamon, put a bunch of that on there. You want to just kind of push this French toast down so it's a little fluted, kind of a rustic look top with some more breadcrumb. You want to take the apple pie, you want to bake it in a 350 degree oven for about 30 minutes. All right, our apple pie has been baking All for about 30 right. minutes now. All right, if you're in kitchen workshop K, we'll cool for about in the third floor teaching so kitchen, so it's easy please to make your way to the landing. Pan is kitchen key workshop here. Just K. Just it easy to serve your plate. This pops right out. We're going to take our, our apple pie for two in the center of the plate there. I have a little bit of Rich's Creme Anglaise, another rich and easy product. Garnish the plate with some of this. 
as your sauce, a little riches on top. And we just want to take a little dusting of cinnamon and powder Kitchen sugar Workshop L across the pie like L? that. You can make your way to the landing. There you have it. French toast. That's the one taking pie. place in the uh, restaurant. We used our French toast batter, creme anglaise, riches on top, and Italian panini bread. Kitchen Workshop M, M, the Woodstone Live Fire. This Burmese watermelon salad is full of texture. Crisp watermelon, toasted peanuts, sweet coconut, green lentils and beans all mixed together with a really simple soy and fish sauce based dressing. Take your diced watermelon, avocado, lentils, green beans, right. ginger and caffeine and lime leaves and, and toss those Nancy? together gently in a bowl. Heat a saute pan, your the add your peanuts the chocolate and toast them and when they start to blacken then workshop. add your coconut, your black and white sesame seeds. And continuously stir on heat until all of the coconut and the sesame seeds are toasted. Remove those to cool and then add them to our watermelon mixture. Toss that to combine and the last step is to make our dressing which is really simple. Lime juice, sugar, soy Kitchen sauce, workshop fish sauce, oh. some salt, peanut make oil, all get landing. stirred together the and mixed into in the, the salad Center. with some torn mint leaves. I love this salad because it combines the flavors of Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, India, the mountains and the sea. It's very helpful, it's got a lot of texture and fun to make. This recipe and the others in this series are available at ciaprochef.com slash watermelon. All right. And then Kitchen Workshop P for the outdoor grill deck. Kitchen Workshop P. You can make your way to the uh, the landing. Did I call everyone? Welcome, welcome. So we're at uh, my toe kitchen. I feel that this restaurant is very unique. Um, it's located uh, at Tongsan area and uh, it's a very humble restaurant. And the idea behind the whole concept is very simple. Three guys, uh, Ben, the chef and a friend of his got together and they decided to bring back um, comfort flavors from mummy's kitchen, from old kitchen. So a lot of the flavors here are what I call um, traditional mummy's food. I know it's been set to death, everybody's trying to reconceptualize that, but this is as true as it gets. Uh, and there's an edge here, although the dishes here um, looks comfortable, General Soul's Kitchen, there's, there's mummy's braised pork with bamboo shoots, and there's pork with a kidney. There are dishes like this, seemingly uh, seemingly, you know, familiar, but but it's not. I, I tuck into a bowl of this, what can be considered their national dish. It's braised uh, pork, and a lot of fat in there. I think they use a lot of neck. And they put it over soft pearl rice. And you, you tear into this like this. Join me, come on. Oh. And then you have a little pickle on the corner there, eh? Huh? Yeah. It's... So tender. It's a nice cheese burger to the Americans. It's comfort to the, the Taiwanese. It's like Singaporeans having chicken rice or Malaysians having nasi lemak or Indonesian friends having beef rendang. It's comfort. Eat this and you're going to call mommy. Huh? How are you, mom? <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> and um, 
And notice they just place one piece of uh, pickled daikon there because when you eat this, man, all the horses go rah, 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 and you just want to non stop. But, but they put this one piece of daikon in it, it just rah, rah, hold your horses. Cuts the fat a little bit. Enjoy, enjoy the whole moment. You know, it just, just calms it and oh. Duro fun. That's what they call this. Excellent. Have you had anything like this in the course of traveling the whole universe? You always have different dishes with rice in it. You know, but again this with the pork and the, the fattiness behind it. Or the, the smoothness I should say. Would you understand and, why this would be so comforting? Oh it's very because it's it's braised a long time. Uh, oh. I guess the chef was saying like three days. The brazen? I don't know. I, th I think so. I mean, the whole thing just just collapses when you put it in there. It's just oh, so smooth. And this is the original, or rather, the Taiwanese general sauce chicken, which is so famous in your neck of the woods. Is it the yeah. same? Is it the same? It, it looks very close. Okay. I mean, okay. I mean, it looks like it, you know. Uh, it's again the brock on the side. It, it's a kind of a chili type sauce. So a little bit of heat behind it. So you can see the, the peppers. It's got a little more vinegar in it. It's a little bit hotter than what I had in the States. The ones I had in the States, you know, See although, sweeter, although they, may, huh? they may use uh, vinegar, the vinegar doesn't come through. And use a very good quality soy sauce here. It's very important. Mm. Thank you. Wow, 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 wow. That's kidneys and that's a lean pork in a broth that's infused with sesame. This is some ginger. There's some ginger here to cut through all that uh, porkiness. And uh, this is very, very, very hearty. This, this, I don't think about mother, I think about grandmother. When they serve a kidney like this, you got to eat it immediately with just a dip of soy sauce. That sit and that crunch will be gone. Well, this piece of pork. I'm gonna try a little bit of the broth. Oh, the pork. Mmm, that's it. That's it. This is it. Uh, chewy, crunchy, softness. Look the texture. Try it. This is another dish which is very popular here. Braised pork, and you know, they really love their braised meats and the. I think the hallmark, the main ingredient in their kitchen is uh, a very good quality soy sauce. There's a, the, the savory, salty soy sauce, and there's a caramelized soy sauce, very thick like honey. It's not salty, it's just... It's not just a sweet, very early, it's, it's not a sweet uh, soy sauce, it's just... It's neither sweet nor, nor salty, and that gives it this flavor here. And they cook this with shoots, bamboo shoots, with bamboo shoots. and uh, with this braised fatty pork. It's a beautiful color to it. There's some um, oh. anise or fennel in that. Yeah, probably. And I just got one little piece of it, so I'm, yeah, yeah. Or maybe a star anise or something. But the short cut would be to use five spice powder. But if you place a piece of uh, star anise in there, then you really gotta watch. You can't leave it in there for too long, otherwise it just change. You know, the whole flavor. Um, yeah, one o'clock and five o'clock, it tastes different in the pot. And this, this is very interesting too. Uh. Um, I've never had this, but I can certainly see you the comfort behind this dish. It's just chopped uh, chives and it's stir fried with uh, century eggs and a brown. So preserved eggs, yeah? Preserved eggs, yeah. So you notice there's some heat in here? Yeah. Yeah, it comes up with a very special chili from Fung Wing. And it, you can't see it, it's, you know, it looks harmless, but. The heat is in there, it's really nice. So this is not a dish you can commonly find around, but it feels so much like home. This chili sauce already has a very thick chili paste. Mm -hmm. I just want you to try the uh, thick soy sauce. What are you talking about? Used with to this? give it that, that smoky, sweet, savory sensation. Not this savory soy sauce dip. It's a caramelized uh, soy sauce. It's not salty, and this gives it that smoky, sweet. You know, I was asking about 
some of the new dishes they're going to come up with and uh, well, he hopes to get ideas from some of these old chefs in small little villages, concepts of dishes. Sometimes they make offerings to the altar, to the ancestors. Uh, there's this idea about this fried fish that they put on the altar and how um, they would um, take it back and then they cook some vegetables with some sauce reduction and they fry the fish again and put it over the fish. So they get all these ideas that comes from society. Yeah. Inspired by um, what well, history society too. comes I mean, it's, it's yeah, history. Yeah. So the guy's not really inventing stuff, right. he's just picking up ideas. And well, lost, maybe some lost it's ideas. It's preservation, it's right. preservation. Aben, says here, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ben. Appreciate it.